Hello, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us for another uh, HAND Internet Live session uh, brought to you by the AO North America HAND Education Committee. Um, just a couple of things. Um, tonight, we have our last stage on stage and it's, it's an honor for us to be able to speak with Dr. Hanel, who um, is uh, a professor of hand surgery at the University of Washington program. I'll get into a little bit more about his um, incredible career and his contribution to uh, hand surgery and orthopedic surgery. Um, I will be your uh, interviewer uh, tonight. My name is Peter Ree from the Mayo Clinic and our moderator tonight to make sure that any questions that you have, uh, we can address them is Dr. Tom Hunt um, from the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Uh, here are disclosures, just so you know. And also, since we are on Zoom, which I think by now everyone understands how Zoom works, uh, keep your microphones muted, please. Um, send in your questions uh, through the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And again, Dr. Hunt will uh, screen these and um, present those questions that may come up um, throughout our talk. Now, Dr. Hanel, uh, I think everyone knows him, and, and I did my training here at the Mayo Clinic in orthopedic residency and my hand surgery fellowship, and I don't know if Dr. Hanel remembers, but uh, uh, he was our um, graduate fellowship graduation uh, um, professor, visiting professor, and I remember thinking, gee, Dr. Hanel is coming. I've read all of his papers, and it was so exciting, but I got to know uh, Dr. Hanel um, through a very private dinner with all the fellows, just the fellows and you know, faculty, and it was amazing uh, just to get to know the person um, behind all of the science and the uh, clinical uh, prowess. Dr. Hanel uh, went to the St. Louis University School of Medicine in St. Louis and stayed there for his orthopedic surgery residency and did the very prestigious uh, Kleiner Kutz um, hand surgery fellowship and trained with Dr. Acklin in microvascular surgery. And um, probably one of the most impressive things about his career thus far is his impact on education. And I, I can't even fathom how many people Dr. Hanel has probably touched in their career. I've been training them and uh, just remarkable. I was looking at uh, Dr. Hanel's bio and the fact that he was the program director for the orthopedic surgery residency in Wa University of Washington for 23 years and also the PD for uh, the hand surgery fellows for five years. So Dr. Hanel, thank you very much for joining us for uh, tonight's um, Sage on Stage. Well, thank you. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, and I thought uh, we would just start off because I think probably a lot of people listening uh, tonight um, may think this is the Dr. Hanel and think uh, you aren't uh, just a normal person and a grandfather and, and a husband. And so I thought I'd just ask you just a couple of questions just so we can understand who Dr. Hanel the person uh, is. So first question, what is your favorite movie? Well, <laughs> I, I like movies for entertainment, but I, I, my favorite movie is, believe it or not, The Man from Snowy River, which is a movie that was in about 1980s. It's an Australian movie. It won an Oscar for the best uh, scene in a movie and for action scene and it's just a perfect western um, my wife thinks i'm nuts but it is uh for me uh, an entertaining movie and i'd recommend it to anybody who wanted to see the perfect western the man from snowy river you heard that everyone that needs to go on your must watch list how about your favorite book books would be harder you know, and, and for medicine, my favorite book always is, and I make my fellows and residents read it, is Lister's The Hand Diagnosis and Indications. And I have on my desk edition one, two, three, and four. Um, edition three and four are the most stolen books that I've ever owned or not owned. You know, I will give them to somebody to read and they just don't seem to come back. My second favorite book is Henry's Extensile Exposure, but I love reading. And so for history, I read Ron Chernow for, bi for biography. I, I like David McCullough mostly because he can define events. Dolores Kearns Goodwin is somebody that uh, we should all read about leadership and how important it is presently. Um, entertainment. My favorite book right now is Letters of Correspondence. 
and it's called Letters of Note, Correspondence Worth a Wider Audience. And it's a collection of letters and notes uh, from the most esoteric, Groucho Marx telling Woody Allen that there's no money in answering fan mail, or the most poignant, where it's a copy of Lincoln's letter to a grieving mother uh, upon the death of her soldier son. Um, it was a gift from Tom Fisher, uh, and uh, I admire Tom Fisher very greatly, and uh, and I use this book for quotes you know, frequently in my uh, dealings with life. I also have an anchor book, you know, something that that when I I just kind of think that I may be lost or or struggling with a, with character, and and that is uh, uh, David Brooks's book, The Road to Character, and he sort of reminds me that we have two sets of virtues. We have a resume virtue and we have a eulogy virtues. And the resume virtue is your CV. And I like, and, and it's very, very important. And the eulogy virtues are, what do they say about you? And what are they gonna say about you at your funeral? You know, who are the, who's the core person that is deciding what you are going to be doing or what you did? and chose to do with your life. So um, it's wor well worth reading, The Road to Character by David Brooks. Well, thanks for sharing those uh, books that we also have to put on our must read uh, during the next COVID surge, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> hopefully not. Um, well, and I think I already know the answer to this, but your favorite hobby, what would that be? Well, I, I, I like fly fishing. I like fly tying. I think I do those pretty well. I play guitar, but I do that very poorly. And I would consider grandchildren a, a hobby if they weren't so addictive. So that's that's what I do. Is that what you thought I would say? The fly fishing, yes. I, we talked about that, oh, this was maybe eight years ago when I was a fellow. So um, I'm glad to glad to hear that that still is your hobby. I th there, one of the reasons why I like fly fishing is I like people that are I, that are better than me. And I like watching and learning um, f fishing guides teach me how to fish better. And a lot of the things that they do, I will, I will be a much better teacher on the, the weeks after spending a couple days fishing, um, just based on that experience. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's just nice to be out in the water and, um, and reading the currents, I guess. Yes. Well, um, you know, Dr. Handel, I think probably of all the things that you've contributed to in the world of hand surgery, um, probably the thing that I think most people uh, think about uh, when they say your name or think about your contributions is really the management of the mangled upper extremity. And I guess my question is, uh, starting off, was this uh, something that came out of passion and you said, you know, I really want to deal with these mangled extremities or was it just a happenstance that you were at a place where it was just a lot of trauma and that's just what came to you and that you became a subject matter expert for that reason? Well, it's probably the latter. And, you know, I was, in, in thinking about answering this question, I wrote a, a very detailed history of my life, which went from the fact that I was, you know, to, to describe me as a, uh, mediocre medical student would be an overstatement. Um, I enjoyed anatomy. I, actually, it was uh, the thing that was my salvation in medical school. And it was the source of learning, always learning anatomy. And I went to a program, a residency program, where the purpose of this program was to turn out very good general orthopedic surgeons in private practice. As a matter of fact, that up until that time, up until the time that I became a faculty member in the 50 years that had preceded that program, uh, there were probably four people that went into academic medicine. But I, at the time, uh, completion of my residency, I, I was really deficient in hand surgery. And I was given the opportunity to spend time in Louisville. And I knew that if you went to Louisville, you had to be a microsurgeon. And I thought that anybody that did a fellowship there came with the skills of any microsurgeon. And so I sat down with a 
dozen or so lab rats and Acklin's manual and taught myself to do microsurgery. Mostly because I just wanted to hold my own when I was in fellowship. And then I, when I was in fellowship, I had the opportunity to spend time with Bob Acklin. And, and it was at the advice of Graham Lister that I do so. And so that led to three months with Bob Acklin doing all kinds of crazy microsurgery that we now accept as standard. And at the end of that three months, he suggested that I spend some time with a guy named Marco Godina in Ljubljana, Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia at the time, now Slovenia. And Marco Godina was a guy that in the late 70s, early 80s, and certainly by 85, 86, had done several hundred free flaps with failure rates of only 4%. And I actually learned how to follow that and was one of the greatest things that happened. And so I returned to Louisville, <clears throat> spent some time as a super fellow along with Louis Shecker and waiting for a job, hoping for one, maybe begging for a job. And uh, eventually I had to get a job. So I went to private practice in Charleston, uh, South Carolina and found that I was spending much more time working at the Medical College of South Carolina than I was in my private practice. And uh, I realized, or my wife uh, was right when she said, I'm just a hopeless academic. And I really wanted to do the hardest cases. And so I, I chose to join the faculty at St. Louis U as a hand surgeon. And while I was there, I was introduced to the AO as a student and later as a faculty member. And that led to a well-funded position with a lab and residents at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. So I established a hand program there in the Department of Orthopedics. And with time, this fellowship integrated with the fellowship that was being run by the plastic surgery department by Hani Motlob and uh, Jim Sanger, John Yusuf. And during my time in Milwaukee, I just honed my skills in dealing with musculoskeletal trauma and taking on, again, the hard problems that uh, were presented there. And at the assistance and insistence of uh, Brian Cooley, uh, I did research in microsurgery education. In about 1982, I was a faculty member at uh, the AO course, at an, at an AO course, and I was asked to present the role of external fixture in the management of orthopedic trauma. And my talk was preceded by a lecture given by Mark Swinkowski. Now, all of you may know that Mark Swinkowski is now the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. He's in practice in Minnesota. Before that, he was the department chair in uh, Minnesota, but before that, he was the director of musculoskeletal trauma at Harborview Medical Center. And he was giving a lecture on open fractures, and open tibia fracture management. And in his closing comments on soft tissues, you know, he, he basically said, you know, as a last resort, I will do free tissue transfer. And I consider it truly experimental surgery because 50% of the cases fail, and there's an even lower success rate when it comes to unions. And at this time, there was two landmark publications in the U.S. literature, one by Cottle and Stern and the other by Ted Hansen, who really went through the consequences of failed free tissue transfer and dragging out the inevitable in these patients and you know, really pushing against that. So my lecture on external fixation, and I, and I didn't know that I was going to be following Dr. Kowski, but in it, I talked about external fixation and debridement. And at that time, I had a success rate of 198 out of 200 free flaps. So two days later, I got a phone call from Mark Swinkowski. Four months later, I joined the faculty at Harborview Medical Center. And I joined Nick Better and Tom Trumbull. And we started a hand fellowship together, the one that blossomed into what we have now. And we have a combined hand program that consists of eight faculty and four fellows. And I, I think is a pretty strong program. So the short answer is, is 
I took advantage of all the circumstances that were presented to me. And uh, I found purpose in what I was doing. I thought I was becoming a master. I tried to master what I was doing and that allowed me to be autonomous. And if you get those three things together, then you have a passion. And that's really how it evolved. I think that uh, the, your comment of um, the building the hand program there in uh, Seattle being a, uh, I think you, you understated it by saying it was a, a good program. I think it's one of the best programs. And I distinctly remember sitting in your office when I was applying and thinking this is just an amazing program, an amazing place, and certainly a lot of trauma. So, uh, you know, some people, I, you know, will get on the podium and talk about trauma and then you realize they don't really deal with trauma like like you guys deal with in with in seattle so you definitely have uh the street rep to uh speak about uh mangled upper extremities i think that um and you probably have seen this too as you counsel your fellows and your residents i know that in um training fellows and residents a lot of times they say well i i really want to go into academics and i want to be the Texas person or this person or that person and I try to guide them that you know I think it's just um, whatever you'll you'll become an expert in whatever you have a lot of volume in. Do you give any what type of advice do you give for your fellows as they leave and they are struggling with oh, this is what I want to do with my career um, this is the direction I want to go in academics any any pearls for the fellows that may have just graduated and are listening now? Well I for me it's you, you need to be available, you need to be affable, you need to be a physician and a surgeon. And you know, I, I think that leading that into any position is going to happen. I, one of the problems that I have right now and I've always had is that, that you look and you find people that I think should be in academics that, that are willing to to ignore geography and then and, and have a spouse or a partner that is willing to ignore geography with you. And uh, I, I think that that's the, the, the most important thing that you can do. And I think then the next thing that you find if you have an academic job is to really develop a relationship with a mentor. And the best way to find a mentor is to start looking at somebody that you want to be your mentor, throw cases at them and see what their response to you is and try to develop a relationship. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, then you're going, you often need to find another mentor. So I think that's about it. You know, they're, they're, as far as your knowledge base goes is I think that, that to be a, a good physician requires you to be a good teacher. And whether you're in private practice teaching your patients or in an academic center teaching patients as well as residents and fellows, it's, it's all much the same thing. You need to know as much as you can learn about the foundation of your, of your practice and uh, how well you're going to work with that. The, um, the mangled upper extremity, how it has become, um, whether you like it or not, I guess, uh, something that people equate with you. Um, there are a lot of people that take trauma call out in, in our country. And um, uh, I think there's the mentality of trauma comes in and, and some people say, you know, it's damage control uh, and they are, they're pretty calm and collected. And then some people that, um, they're really anxious and nervous about it just because there's so much going on. Do you have any pearls for just your overall approach to the most devastated upper extremity that comes to your OR? How you, just an overview of what you think about and how you uh, manage the patient in that initial setting and then how you plan your future reconstruction? I know it's a big question, but maybe just, uh, just an overall approach on how you look at these type of injuries. Well, I I, one is I enjoy trauma, okay? And so you have to know that, that I am not impacted negatively by, by trauma. 
So, but my step one is always the same, and that's to be the physician. We're physicians and surgeons. And as a physician, I think that our, our number one thing that we have to do is to practice empathy and practice with them that is empathic. You know, so you pick up the phone, you pick up the pager, you pick up the chart as you walk into the emergency room, and you ask the very simple question, how can I help you? And you learn about the patient first and then incorporate that into the management of the injured extremity. And anybody that has trained with me, the, the first thing I say on day one, on PGY1 of their residency is, when you pick up a phone, you answer this, how can I help you? And the second thing that happens is once you have an idea of what you're dealing with, take charge, take responsibility of this. And I think this is why I, I particularly like uh, Stephen Ambrose's book uh, on Band of Brothers. And, and one of his characters is a guy named Bill Winter who you know, was always leading his man from the front and doing something that, that he would never have his people do, something that he would not have done himself or did himself. And I think that's really true of, of dealing with a mangled extremity. I think that the, the, the technically the right thing to do is to remove first as your very first step is all doubtfully viable tissue. So when I set up an OR, I believe that the most senior person involved in that case ought to be present for the debridement of an open mangled extremity. And my partners believe that too. So at those cases at three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning, which we still do as hand surgeons, um, there's an attending there. And so, I think that the keystone to reconstruction is to breed everything that is doubtfully viable. The second thing that you have to have in the back of your mind is don't worry about how you're gonna close the wound. You'll figure it out later and that will reveal itself. So you really do need to worry that you have left dead material behind, not that you're going to be able to close the wound. Skeletal fixation is the foundation of the reconstruction. So how are you going to reconstruct that skeleton? And I think that you need to know what works for you. When I first started this, we did a lot of external fixation, especially on the uh, lower extremity. And more and more and more, we are going away from that and using internal fixation in the setting of a well-debrided wound. And then the third step is after you've reconstructed the soft tissues into the most functional position that you can or in preparing for later reconstruction, you have to close the wound with something that will allow later reconstruction. And so you have to plan on that. So, you know, my plastic surgery colleagues talk about the reconstruction elevator, not a ladder, but a reconstruction elevator going from the wound you're either going to a simple first floor, I know I can close this wound, or looking at this wound and going to the top saying I have to do free tissue transfer in order to close it. And so we have all of that available for us. And that's really my approach to the mangled upper extremity or the mangled lower extremity for that matter. Yeah, I remember you, uh, uh, those tenants that you gave uh, a while back ago at the uh, a, a course that I was at, and, and those words still remain true to this day that I think about that initial debridement is, is the most important and how always the attending should be there to make that decision. And, and that's, um, I think that advice is something that um, I think we forget a lot of times and um, that probably just comes from your experience and probably saving some sort of tissue that seems like it's okay and it's, it's the one thing that ruins everything from a infection or whatnot. You know, it's it's sort of interesting. It's it's fun to hear how people parody you, and and I I have residents who said, well, you know, what did I learn from Dr. Handel? I I learned from Dr. Handel that that's got to go. 
and I, I'd walk into a room or walk, I'll be in the middle of a case watching somebody debride. And they'll be trying to decide whether or not it needs to be debrided and I'll just look at it and go, that's got to go. So yeah, I, I hear that a lot from my fellows and from my residents. And that decision to say, uh, well, that's got to go, um, I'm sure that comes from the time that you said, I think that could stay. And so my question is, I'm sure you are where you are now because you have made mistakes along the way um, and made a poor clinical decision that ultimately shaped the way you practice. And I think good or bad, I think surgeons are fairly anecdotal in saying, well, I, I do it this way because at one time this happened. Can you recall a decision that you made that at the time seemed right but was probably the wrong answer and that set the path for you to do things completely different or always choose a different path uh, down the way in your career? Well, yeah, I, I can. And, and it comes to the fact that when backs first were started and for first entertained, it was awesome. It made my life so easy when I could induce healthy granulation tissue in a bed that I could put a skin graft on. I didn't have to do a flap. Uh, and then I came to realize that you can't operate through a wound that has been grafted over a vacked granulation bed. And so what I had failed to realize or failed to, to follow my own plan, which was you need to think in the absolute long term. You need to look at where you're going to be six months from now. And so I still use Vax, but if I think that I am going to have to operate through that wound again in order to bring function to an upper extremity or healing to a bone, um, I will, um, will cut short the period of time that I use a Vax and will do definitive uh, soft tissue reconstruction, either local or distant or free tissue transfer, knowing that I will be placing a piece of tissue that is going to provide blood supply to the wound, that is going to be supple, that will have skin, subcutaneous fat, and fascia, that I can operate through um, as necessary and not have to worry about closing a, a very stiff wound. And I think that's one of the problems that I see a fair amount of still where I will have patients who um, were treated appropriately, debrided well, fixation is appropriate. They were backed to death and then skin grafted. And then when it came time for doing the reconstruction work on bone, um, they couldn't close those wounds. And that led to the infection that then led to the osteomyelitis that then led to the broad resections and extension of this uh, terrible trauma into the second and third year of the wound and the wound's existence. So that's my biggest mistake. And that's the, the one big mistake. And I, and I did it in the first couple years that, uh, that the backs came out or we were introduced to them. And I think it's a great tool, but uh, it is, you have to think about your end game before you use that great tool. Yeah, the, um, I think you're right. I, I'm guilty of that too. Just trying to take care of the acute immediate stage and then not thinking about the long game and then thinking, gosh, I should, probably should have just done some free tissue transfer or whatnot. So. That's, I, uh, that's, that's nice to hear that you, you've also gone through that uh, evolution, I suppose. Um, and, and other than the uh, mangled upper extremity, uh, the stiff elbow I know is a, is a passion of yours too, and you have a lot of experience with that. So let's say, take away the, the pigeonholed, uh, uh, respectfully, pigeonholed things that people equate to you. Is there anything else in hand surgery that is, a passion that maybe people don't immediately equate with with you? Um, well, you know, I actually like pediatrics. 
And I do a fair, and I like doing a fair amount of uh, pediatric surgery. Um, so that, that's the, the one thing that, that I like to do uh, that people really wouldn't know much about. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I had no idea, Dr. Handel. And, and is it, uh, is it just because it's such a complete opposite from the, the volume of trauma and things that you have, uh, taking care of congenital things and, or is it because you're a grandfather and and, uh, <laughs> and uh, maybe now you can sit back after your kids have grown up and enjoy the little ones and maybe that's why why I guess I wouldn't have even thought that pediatrics would have been a an interest of yours. Yeah, you know, and I, I, it really is, and it was an influence. I was influenced by Graham Lister, and uh, uh, Graham Lister was a very good, very good pediatric uh, surgeon. And he was very good friends with Dieter Buckramko. And, the, and if, you know, Dieter Buckramko popularized thumb policization. And the, uh, and the time of uh, thalidomide uh, injury, birth injury, in the late 60s. So, yeah, I, and it was just, it was one of those things that, that I continued to do. And I... I you know, I've never written anything based on my experience with pediatric cases other than the case studies and cohorts that I did on free tissue transfer in children in um, the late 90s or in the, in the late 80s uh, at a time when we were advised not to operate on children because the success rate was so abysmal doing free tissue transfer in children. And so that just continued from there. But other than that, I don't do, I have a, I have a normal practice. I enjoy doing thumb CMC arthritis. I enjoy doing Dupatrons. I enjoy doing simple uh, non-mangled extremity reconstruction. Yeah, I'm sure that the mangle extremity is is uh, uh, just a small portion, well, probably larger than most um, portion of your practice. That's pretty well well rounded. Um, now, in your career, uh, well over a hundred publications and um, just an enormous amount of book chapters. Is there what would you say is your proudest or the the study that or publication that you had that to you was the most impactful, uh, that you are the most proud of its contribution to hand surgery? Um, I actually think it's the article that I, that was published in, oh, 2005, I believe. And it was in the Journal of Bone and Joint, the British volume. And the primary author is Hans Kreter, um, myself and Julie Egel. And it's, it was titled Indirect Reduction and Percutaneous Fixation versus Open Reduction and Internal Fixation for Displaced Intraarticular Fractures of the Distal Radius, a randomized controlled trial. And it was at the time that we published this, one of two double-blind randomized studies in the orthopedic literature. And really the impact of the paper wasn't whether or not internal fixation was better than external fixation. It was whether or not you could reduce fractures to a level that they would heal and that the outcome would be the same, whether or not you were able to do internal fixation or extra-articular or, I mean, intra-articular fracture fixation percutaneously. And the premise of the paper in the end was, if I can reduce a fracture to being an articular surface and step off that is less than two millimeters, or gap that is less than two millimeters, a length that is at least neutral, a radial inclination that is neutral, and a stable distal radial ulnar joint, if you could do that, 
percutaneously, is that going to get you a result that is as good as internal fixation? And the answer is yes, it always is. And so in leading to and looking at later publications of mine or of anyone else, I think that we all basically say or should be saying, how can I get to what I accept as, a, as an adequate reduction with the least amount of fixation and the least amount of surgery. And um, so, and that's why I do that. And it's, it was the hardest paper that I w wrote or worked on. Um, it was rejected multiple times by uh, the Journal of Bone and Joint American volume. And it was uh, quite ironic that after we published it in uh, the British Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, the following month there was an editorial by uh, uh, Andy Weiland, who extolled the virtues of the paper in the American edition of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. And it was a paper that actually won a, an award at the OTA meeting um, a couple years prior to its publication. Now, I would imagine in 2005, the, uh, when, correct me if I'm wrong, but volar lock plates were kind of becoming more, um, more uh, I guess, widespread in the early 2000s. And I, I would imagine at that time, the results of the study, you could interpret it as, well, you don't have to do this new thing. You can do um, close reduction, percutaneous pin fixation, X-fix. Um, now, fast forward to today, and still a lot of studies that still try to compare the same thing. And like you said, the outcomes are fairly similar. But then I think now people say, well, you could do that and it's the same, but why not just use a internal fixation? So when would you uh, choose to use for a closed intraarticular disarrhage fracture, choose to do an X-fix with pins versus just a standard lower locking plate or some sort of internal fixation? Well, I have to admit, I haven't done that in 10 years. I have not, you know, and when I have patients with open trauma and open distal radius fractures that are transferred with their external fixers in place, one of the first things that I do during the debridement and stabilization of those wrists is remove the external fixture and 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 have introduced into my practice the use of bridge plating to do what I used to do with external fixtures. Now having said that, there are still some two, three part interarticular fractures that can be controlled percutaneously. And I will still do percutaneous pin fixation pin fixation on them. Mostly just to prove that I can do it. And the outcomes on those patients um, is as good or better than the patients that I do with internal fixation. And that, that's a good segue, Dr. Hanel, to the uh, dorsal standing plate or the distraction bridge plate because um, your J.D. Jess article, I think combined with um, uh, Dr. Roosh and the folks out at Duke, I think that that I think has revolutionized the way that we treat the serrated fractures in terms of um, the ones that are really smashed, whether intraarticular or metaphyseal combination, and using that same principle but internal. And I think that's it's an incredible contribution. I think to me, um, in hand surgery that you've contributed. Um, now, from that initial JDGS article and the corollary uh, technique article, what have you changed in uh, how you use the dorsal spanning plate? Um, anything, I think that the probably thing I would think about the most is initially the third metacarpal and then switching to the second metacarpal. Is there anything else that you have changed from that as you learn through all your experience in following these patients? Well, first of all, I, and I do this as a preamble to every lecture that I give on bridge plating or distraction plating is that you know, this concept was uh, presented in 1999 at the 
or 98 at the Hand Society meeting that was in Seattle. And it was presented by uh, Ed Burke and Rick Singer, who are hand surgeons in Detroit and still practicing hand surgeons. And they presented oh, a, a cohort of patients uh, in the hundreds at the Hand Society um, using bridge plating techniques from radius to the third metacarpal um, and three pipe plates. And they were booed off the stage. I mean, people just, it was, it was ugly. And, you know, I, I listened to that. And as it turned out, about two weeks or three weeks later, I uh, had a patient who had such a terrible, terrible wrist metadiaphyseal fracture that I was going to put them into an external fixture, but they had multiple trauma. They were going to be in and out of the ER. 100% of all my external fixtures that lived in ICUs for more than 10 days became infected. And so I put on a distraction plate. And at the time that I removed the, and, and I put on that the distraction plate with the intention that after the metadaph seal fragments had healed, I could then go on and perform a standard radiocarpal fusion. So I took off the plate at about three, four months later, and there was like a smooth gliding surface. And so I left it alone and didn't didn't do the fusion on this particular patient. And this same patient who I, who I see frequently, mostly because she lives in my neighborhood, is, uh, has continued to have that wrist. So that's where the cases started from. Now, the reason that I switched from the third metacarpal to the second metacarpal is I didn't like putting plates into the fourth medic into the fourth compartment. And I thought that there was a lot of interference and gliding of the of tendons and the extensor tendons over those plates. And it, it, it just seemed to me to be a harder wound. These people had a harder time rehabbing their hands. Um, they had more metacarpal uh, loss of metacarpal motion because of that. And it took them longer to, uh, to rehab their hand. I think, and, and because of that, I went to the second compartment and I used uh, the, a plate that was in the maxillofacial set. And it was uh, a plate with longitudinal holes that uh, were about 20 centimeters long. Um, they had scallops on the edges. And uh, it worked okay. Uh, I had problems with some tendon ruptures. I had two tendon ruptures of the extensor carpi radialis longus when I removed the scalloped plates uh, from the wrist and was able to uh, talk synthes um, into building a, a smoother plate that uh, they still build. Um, and, and I thought that we would... Uh, use it uh, with more frequency, and we did. And then we took these plates and we started looking, I started looking at the biomechanics of having that plate on the dorsum of the wrist in the second compartment compared to the fourth compartment. And a uh, foot, and now foot and ankle surgeon in Boise, Idaho, John Wolf, as a medical student, uh, did a uh, biomechanics study on second versus fourth uh, positioning. And in that, he demonstrated that if you take this piece of steel and you put it into the second compartment, um, its equivalent strength is a, 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 to flexion and extension is exactly the same as a 3-5 plate in the fourth compartment. So it succeeded in doing that. And then other things came from that. One, from the, one of the things that came from that was the fact that, that uh, you only need three, not four screws. 
Um, I learned from having plates that had holes directly over the radiocarpal joint that those represented stress risers. And I was uh, uh, apprised of some dramatic ruptures of that or breakage of that plate and then devastating injuries to extensor tendons. And, um, and from that, I have always recommended that we, we not use those plates that have central holes in them because of the, uh, the potential for their breakage. The, uh, and so the plates that I have asked people to build for me, um, and I never received any money for ridge plating. Um, I, I think that the, what I have done is convince people to make a very simple plate that, uh, that we can apply and that does a job of holding the distal radius in uh, longitudinal traction. Now, one of, the uh, one of the last points of this is that if you place a bridge plate, the bridge plates that are available to us now, that will fit into the second compartment, you will restore length, you will restore radial inclination, and you'll restore volar tilt by the placement of that plate along the radial aspect of the radius through the second compartment and to the uh, second metacarpal. So that's how that all evolved. Peter? Peter, yeah. may, I, uh, may I jump in with a question from the audience? Yeah. Um, so Dr. Hanel, you know, obviously your uh, expertise in, in uh, trauma and reconstruction and the mangle extremities is, is, is incredible. But we had somebody who wanted to know something about your approach to a basic hand surgery problem, and that's thumb CMC joint arthritis, as you mentioned it earlier. And, and really, after attempts at conservative management have failed, what's your, what do you do and, and how do you handle the MP joint if there's a hyperextension type deformity? So um, my approach is I continue to use what works well for me. And so I still do an LRTI. I uh, will use some suspension plasties, arthroplasties, as is described by Peter Weiss. But my basic go-to is still an LRTI. My approach to the, CM, to the MP joint is if they have any hyperextension, I will more likely than not convince them that I want to fuse that joint. And uh, we'll do that. And so I, I will do a few fusion of the MP joint combined with an LRTI in the great majority of my cases. Do you ever perform any other kind of uh, procedure to avoid hyperextension? Do you ever? Do well, so if I, you know, it's very interesting because, you know, I say, I, I should say no, but in the last couple cases that I've done, I've had patients that have had 10 to 20 degrees of hyperextension. And I have done a volar capsule adhesis. Uh, and I just go through a, a volar Bruner approach. We'll take the volar plate of the MP joint, put it into a flexed posture and hold it in place with a suture anchor doing that. If they have more than you know, 20, 30 degrees or 20 degrees of hyperextension, if they have 30 to 40 degrees of hyperextension, then I just always fuse them. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Well, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, just a couple of further questions that um, kind of go a step away from the mangled upper extremity. I think in your um, vast experience of training residents and fellows, what things do you see as uh, the traits from when they were a resident or fellow that later on corresponds or correlates to um, a good surgeon? Because um, I'm sure that uh, in our audience tonight are a lot of young surgeons out there, maybe even in training. Um, any, anything that you see in, in all of your former residents and fellows that 
correlate with um, being good surgeons at, in, in practice in their career? Well, I think that, that he who knows 360 degree anatomy is one up on everybody else. And if you think about it, where do you hesitate? And when do you become hesitant? It's when you go, where is that radial nerve relative to that distal humerus? Or where is the posterior interosseous as I'm sitting here between the radius and the ulna in the proximal form? So that's number one, is you have good surgeons know anatomy. And then the next thing is, I think the, the people that succeed are, are people that fall into the category of, of the, the four H's. And the four H's is honesty, humility, hard work, and humor. And the honesty is, you know, the ability to tell the truth and be willing to take the consequences of that. So you own your mistakes. I think good surgeons own their mistakes. And by that, I, I mean that this is the mistake that was made. This is a skill that I don't have. And I'm going to go out of my way to learn that. But that requires me to take time out of my practice and out of my pocketbook to learn how to be a better arthroscopist. Then you have to do that if that's going to be an essential part of your practice. Or you have to be willing to look at a patient and say, I'm not very good at this. I'm gonna send you to somebody else. So that's the honesty thing. I think, you know, it, humility really is helpful also in this. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I readily admit that I am not the smartest guy in the room, but I surround myself with really smart people and I make sure that the people that I hire are, are really a lot smarter than me. And, and because of that, you'll always learn. You'll always be that, that person who asks the question that, that I can't answer. And I, I love it when I have a, a fellow present me with a series of articles or a series of questions that I really don't know the answer to. And, and have them have an answer that they think they have the answer to. And, and often I'll change a practice uh, based on, on what they have said and, and, and have done. And I, you know, I, one of my last fellows that, that we just finished with was just like that. She, could, she was just on top of the literature. She was on top of, of what I did. And she would say, why do you do this A versus what they say in the literature? And I'd, and sometimes I'd have to say, I don't know, you know, because it worked for me and actually changed things because it worked a lot better uh, for her. And then uh, I think that there, there are people that if you look at, at the truly prominent mid-career hand surgeons, for instance, Peter Reed, okay? What, what's the one thing that they all have in common? I think for the most part, they are the people that say, I am the hardest working person in the room and you can't outwork me. And I take pride in being the hardest working man or woman in the operating room. And that's the common thread. It's that, that, that there's a passion there. And then the final thing is good humor. And he is sort of, you go, what? You know? Can you tell a joke? Well, it's not so much can you tell a joke, but can you take a joke? And can you make sure that, that your humor allows you to look at your mistakes and work through your mistakes? Because if you are humorless, you will never be able to survive your mistakes. And we all make mistakes. So I, I think those are the things that if I look at the common thread of the most successful hand fellows that I have, they have the four H's. Thing, things to, uh, I guess, strive for, those four H's. I think in our last five minutes, Dr. Hanel, um, I think probably a personal question, I guess, is now you've been through the very busy part of your career, I'm sure that at times you missed out on, or maybe you didn't, um, missed out on things with your family or with your friends and things like that. And now with grandchildren and um, I guess enjoying the success of all of your hard work, 
for younger surgeons, um, do you have any advice in retrospect um, how to better balance work and life? Which, the, which I know it sounds like a lot of people think work-life balance means that you're lazy, but I think that you have to balance it. Um, do you have any, any last advice on how we can better do that? You know, I don't know if, if, it, it's, if I have really good advice, but if I were, I, I knew that my life actually changed for the better. When my wife pointed out to me that, that there's no such thing as work-life balance because you're always going to be off balance. You're either going to be spending too much time with family if, if you're trying to balance your life. And, and again, looking at the David Brooks and listening to Peggy Hamill, it, it was really kind of, when you're at work, be at work. And when you're at home, be at home. And, you know, so you sitting in your office at home is not you being home. It's you sitting in your office doing work at home. And so the, you've robbed that from it. So I think that if we need to look at where we are going to be out of balance. So when I try, when I'm at home, I really try my very hardest not to do clinical work. I save that time and I will take and spend extra time or a lot of time uh, extra at work in order to get all that stuff done. Uh, I no longer have the privilege of taking call. I am now 70 years old, and so I, I've stopped doing that. But when I was taking call, I would always use all of my call time to work on manuscripts, academic things, doing that stuff, so that when I went home, I could just play. And uh, my office is more of a flying, a fly tying table, and some and, and and a book and a shelf of books that I would think that I might want to read or hope that I get to reading, and so and spending time with with Peggy, my grandkids, and my kids, and so I think that that one of the things that people really regret is that they really can't balance this, and I don't think anybody can, so I try not to. Work hard when you're working, play hard when you're playing. That's, a, that's advice my dad gave me. Work hard, play hard. And I think it's so true. It's hard to, it's hard to separate the two, but I think that um, if you can, then your kids and your spouse won't, they will win, like you said, about your eulogy. Um, they, they won't remember all the uh, awards and publication. It'll be uh, you know, when dad or mom were home, uh, they were actually home. Uh, Dr. Handel, as, as we close here, uh, uh, forgive me if this is not your quote, but uh, I remember one time uh, you giving a talk in, um, and, and uh, uh, you saying this. Is this your quote, Dr. Handel? Yes, that is. And, and I, I think it is, it's, it's the thing I think about all the time. I think as surgeons, we, we think that, uh, well, the implant's going to do this or that, but it's the, so much the surgeon and decision making, and I tell this to all my residents and fellows. It's one of my favorite quotes. Um, thank you very much for this in itself is one of the best contributions, I would say. It's, it's something that resonates in my head all the time. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight uh, on this uh, final Sage on Stage. And what a great way to end this series. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, for everyone that has, um, that have, uh, been on the stage and stage and all these other other uh, AO North American hand education. You can access these uh, through YouTube, um, and also don't forget to um, take the final poll uh, so you can get your CME credit. Dr. Hanel, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, it's a pleasure and it's a true honor to share my passion with all of you. Good night now, Dr. Hanel and Peter. Thank you very much for a wonderful session. And on behalf of the entire AO North America Hand Education Committee, please accept our gratitude. Thank you, everyone. And we'll meet again in September. Good night.